Here's what's coming up on today's show. If you retired and then you have this sequence of return risk of that it goes way down, well, the chances of you running out of money just instantly increase. Welcome to the Perfect Game Retirement Podcast with former professional baseball player and now financial coach at Black Oak Asset Management, Ryan Ledman. This show will help you make the right financial decisions so you can pitch a perfect game in retirement. Here's the wind-up and the delivery. Welcome into Perfect Game Retirement. Glad to have you on the show today as we go through eight of the biggest money mistakes that people make. It's a complex world retirement planning is, and it is obviously easy to fall into some pitfalls and some common ones that people often go through. So today we'll try to identify those for you and help you navigate them so you don't fall trapped to those mistakes as well. We do that as always with Ryan Ledden, who is a president and financial coach over at Black Oak Asset Management. Ryan, how are you today? Hey, doing well. That's uh, these money mistakes. There, there, there could be a whole lot more, but I had to uh, dwindle it down. But uh, kind of pick the the top uh, eight or so that uh, I thought. Hopefully, people get uh, get some ideas and impact out of it. Yeah, I mean, you could go on. The list could go. We could make this <laughs> two or three parts probably. But hopefully, over the course mm-hmm. of this episode, you'll hear something that. Uh, maybe catches your attention or maybe something that you've thought about or a mistake that maybe you think you're on track to make that maybe you can avoid hopefully through this. But if you have questions for Ryan uh, or want to follow up and, and make sure that you're on the right track, you can always schedule your retirement coach 360 session online right now. Just go to blackoakam.com to do that. I know you guys have uh, been pretty busy, uh, school finishing up, sports still getting, I guess, ramped back up heading into summer, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. Got yeah. Softball continues on, and which is ha- having a good season. I enjoy watching these girls play. I've been coaching for a few years now, so it's a uh, it's really cool to to see how much they've how much they've progressed. And you know, we're at that twelve and thirteen uh, age group where you start to see the divide. You start to see kids mm-hmm. grow and get better and love it, or some who don't grow and realize, oh gosh, this maybe isn't for me, and that's okay. Um, but you know, softball, baseball, my son, we're, we're finishing up, and then hopefully I'll have some good uh, some good track updates from from him. And you know, he had a good good summer last year, so we'll see if he can medal again on the national stage. We'll we'll see, but uh, the expectations for are high for him as on his club team last year there were zero expectations because he was brand new so we'll see how he he handles a new age group and uh, a little bit more pressure maybe on his shoulders which i hate because he's nine years old but yeah still you know when you when you do well you got a bullseye on your back yeah i'm, I'm excited to kind of hear those updates throughout the summer from you it's gonna be a lot of fun to kind of track his progress it's hard to believe he's only nine it feels like We've kind of been talking about him for a while now. It feels like he should be getting close to high school, um, but it's uh, he's been awesome to follow his progress. So looking forward to that, and we wish you the best of luck uh, throughout the summer. Let's jump into these money mistakes in. Ryan, we got a mailbag question coming up, plus the getting to know you question for Ryan as well. We'll get to here in a bit, but we got eight that we want to jump through again. You know, no particular order necessarily, and of course, this doesn't cover all the money mistakes that are out there, but these are some crucial missteps that we want you to avoid because they can have a significant impact on the success of your retirement. And let's begin with taxes, um, ignoring those tax applications that could be coming in the future in your retirement, or will be coming in many cases in the future to your retirement savings is that first money mistake we want to start with. Yeah. And if people have been listening to the show for a while, they know taxes are a big part of what we do from not from a tax preparation standpoint, but accounting for them and, and knowing what we're, we're, what we're paying now in taxes and what we could potentially pay in the future. So we're very passionate about that, but yeah, completely ignoring tax implications and, and kind of, I, I love it when people just kind of put their head down and save, 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 and diligently dollar cost averaging, whether that's through their outside accounts or 401ks, uh, or 403Bs, whatever you have access to, but um, putting your head down and then ignoring that from a tax standpoint is, I, I think, a little bit financially irresponsible just because there's so much tax implications in retirement. Now, I know depending on what your age is, we don't know what those tax rates are going to be. Now, if you're knocking on the door of retirement, yes, okay, we do know that the current tax code is supposed to go away on 1231 of 2025. And we have a reset of what our previous uh, tax code was before they were uh, changed a few years ago. And it goes, it's, it sunsets back to that in 2026. So we do know, unless lawmakers change it, 
taxes will be slightly higher, not significantly higher. Now, could that change? Sure. Could that really change 10 years from now, 15, 20? Absolutely. I mean, as we're recording the show, all we hear about is um, the debt ceiling. Uh, you know, what's what's the government going to do? We're going to have a shutdown. No, we're not. Mm-hmm. We're not going to have a shutdown. They're going to figure it out because eventually these two polarizing sides are going to figure out a solution, which they normally do. Now, is it a solution that's <laughs> good for everyone? Uh, probably not because shockingly, they spend more money than they take in in tax revenues. So they got to figure that out first, but they're going to figure that budget out. But as over time, if, if that continues to get worse and worse, as far as the spread between revenues and expenses, they're going to have to raise tax rates. I don't know on what, but they're going to have to raise tax rates. So I want to take that in consideration now, no matter what your age is and what they look like down the road, because there's so many factors in retirement that taxable income changes other things. What I mean by that is if you only save in a pre-tax 401k, every dollar you take out is going to be taxed, which means that's taxable income, which spills over into your Medicare premiums, which spills over into how much of your social security gets taxed, which we've, again, we, we've talked about this on the show before, but if you're just now listening, yeah, there's it, your tax return. Um, it, it, it just, again, it, it continues to spill over into other categories. So Roth money, or even brokerage account money is more tax efficient because Roth money is never taxed again. You put it in, you pay the tax on the seed and you collect the harvest. That's the analogy I like to use on on those things. Well, some people may argue, oh, well, I'm going to be in a higher tax bracket today than I will be later. Okay. Today, maybe like if you retire next year, okay, maybe you are in a lower tax rate, but what's it going to be in five, 10, 15? I don't know. I don't know what that's going to be, but if you have no wiggle room, with your different taxable accounts, then you're at the mercy of what lawmakers make. So gosh, taxes are a huge component of financial planning. And if you can save on taxes just by not asset allocation, I mean, I can, I can push a button and do asset allocation is asset location, different, different investments are taxed differently depending on what type of account they're in. So Again, I'm kind of going down a rabbit hole here, but there's so many little nuances to know and to find out about from a taxation standpoint and to go ahead and start planning for it now it makes a huge impact because if you're if you're paying less to the IRS that makes your nest egg last longer. Yeah, just make sure you're aware of those tax implications and have those conversations about just understanding what you're invested in and what that could mean in retirement. All right, our second big money mistake as you shift into retirement, Ryan, that mindset has to shift as well and, and too many people continue to have that old mindset of of uh, what are my returns? I need to focus on seeing what that is versus, okay, what am I going to do about income in retirement? Yes, this this one uh, is, I'm very passionate about as well on top of the, the one we just talked about with taxes, but it's 100% about your income. What income do you have coming in every single month? Now, when I say income, that could be coming from your nest egg. That could be coming from certain investments that spin off interest or dividends. That could be social security. That could be a pension. Uh, So there's so many different things to think about, but it's about income. And we work with a lot of pension employees, a lot of state employees. And yeah, their nest egg may not be as large as someone who has been plowing away into their 401k their entire life that don't have a pension. They may not have as big a nest egg, but they know when they wake up every single month, they got several thousands of dollars coming in. And that's on top of social security as well. So it's not difficult especially if you have pensions coming in and social security, it's not difficult to have a really good seven to $10,000 income every single month. And you may not have hardly anything in your nest egg. So you shouldn't worry about rates of return. So rates of return are so much less important. It's about the consistency of returns, not your average rate of return, but consistency. Very Two very, very different concepts. Consistency is what you want in retirement. Average rate of return is what you want in accumulation phase when you are saving. So all about income and retirement. Yes, I know nest egg can produce a income. So sometimes nest egg dollar amount matters if you don't have anything else coming in, but usually you have something. You either have a pension or social security, sometimes both, but you have something coming in that will cover your fixed costs. Obviously your social security benefit depends on how much you paid into the system but your nest egg can produce an income. So if it's only social security and your nest egg, then okay, it's got to produce an income. But 
again, you don't want to chase that rate of return because the volatility on that's way much higher than a, con a portfolio that is constructed to have consistent rates of return where you want income. So definitely what you have coming in every single month, way more important than average rate of return. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We're talking about money mistakes. If you have questions for Ryan, again, you can follow up blackoakam.com or call 470-508-508. Zero five zero eight. Um, the next one here, re relying solely on employer-sponsored retirement plans. Why is that? Could that be a mistake for people, Ryan? A few reasons, um, and I'll kind of hone in on two. Really, one, your your four hundred one k or your retirement plan through work may stink. <laughs> Let's just okay. come out there and say it. The options may stink. Uh, there may not be a match. Uh, there are just some things that some employers may not be able to offer. So you can't just solely rely on that. They also may not have a Roth option inside of there. It may be all pre-tax, which is fine, uh, but it's not very difficult at all for your employer to add a Roth option on there. So if you don't have one, talk to someone at work, Take talk to a decision maker, say, hey, can we add a, four, uh, a Roth to our 401k? It's literally checking a box when they do the annual review with their uh, 401k provider. So solely on retirement uh, employee sponsor plans, I wouldn't do because again, you may not have tax flexibility and you may not have investment flexibility. If you do things outside, either on your own or through an advisor, obviously the investment selections are unlimited. You can have different types of alternative investments that aren't just market-based. They could be real estate-based. They could be partnerships inside there. Anyway, so there's a bunch of different types of investments that you could do that may not be inside of a 401k. And, and some people who are super risk adverse, insurance products, annuities, things like that may be an option as well. Not all 401ks uh, offer those types of strategies involved in there. So solely relying on that, mainly from a tax standpoint and an investment standpoint, you need to do something probably outside of it. Okay. Let's shift gears then to long-term care costs, uh, something we've talked about on the show quite a bit, but the big money mistake that people often make is just ignoring that for whatever reason. It could be that I don't want to talk about it right now. I feel pretty good about where I am. I don't think I'm going to need it for quite some time or just blocking it out altogether, but not planning for that is a big, could be a huge mistake. Yep. Uh, some people want to put their head in the sand. Uh, they, they, it's so uncomfortable for some people to talk about. I don't get it. They'll talk about leaving a legacy and death, but they won't talk about, you know, them struggling, them needing assistance from someone else. Now, if someone has a personal experience where they've had to take care of someone or see a loved one be taken care of, then you usually don't have to, they'll bring the topic up. You usually don't have to, but it's got to be a part of the conversation. And hey, what are we doing? What are we doing in case of, you know, healthcare, long-term care costs are, are, are really, really high. Uh, no, I won't need it. Well, okay, let's let's at least talk about it. it hey, if you want to self-fund it, okay, that's fine. You, you may need to save more because it could end up costing you this, depending on what area of the war, uh, uh, country you live in. So having to address it, having to talk about it, it doesn't mean long-term care insurance. It does not. That's a that's one of many strategies. Self-funding is another strategy. Again, that can deplete a nest egg pretty quick. So your person you leave behind when you pass away uh, may not have nearly as many assets. So you do have to think about that. There are annuities that help pay for long-term care. There are life insurance hybrids that help pay for long-term care. So there are other options just than a long-term care insurance policy that every carrier under the sun used to be selling it when they first started selling these things. And now there's only a handful. And the underwriting is extremely difficult because they can be very picky on who they offer this stuff to. So it's 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 hard to get, but it's got to be talked about. It's got you got to have a plan for it. And it, it it's got to be talked and addressed in some shape, form, or fashion. All right, we got eight. We're going through. We're halfway through them. Um, inflation is something that's top of mind right now. Um, I think most people understand how difficult your finances can be in a high inflation environment like we're currently in. So you have to be adjusting your budget in retirement to to keep up with inflation too, right? And that's a mistake is people aren't doing that. Yeah, and, and I still chose this one even though it's not as big of a point to convince people on. I mean, when inflation yeah. was running at 2% or 3%, it was like, oh yeah, that's fine. Yeah, no big deal. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's true. Obviously things have changed the last couple of years. So I think accounting for that because there's still pain of a lot of that still lingering, but the pain of it shooting up uh, the last couple of years post COVID. 
So you've seen a lot of this inflationary thing starting. It, it kind of seems more impactful on the real estate side. And it just seemed like it trickled down everywhere else after that. Now, I'm not saying that was the start of it, but that's just seemed like what was the biggest impact. Like, holy cow, house pri- housing prices are just through the roof. And then it just all of a sudden fuel, food. I mean, you named it. It's like, good grief. So obviously the Fed jacking up interest rates is trying to slow that down. It has slowed its pace. It's still growing a little bit, but it has slowed its pace down. So it, the convincing of this is not is, uh, as bad. Now figuring out what that inflation rate is going to be for a long period of time, mm, that's, that's, that's difficult because even when you factor in the last couple of years, it still sits just under 4% uh, as far as inflationary rates go, which is still relatively low. But obviously the last couple of years have moved that up uh, quite a bit. But we're human. Uh, we forget things really, really quick. So I could just see in the next couple of years, if, if, if inflation slows down, interest rates start coming down, then that inflation conversation then starts to fade away again. So we're just forgetful people and we have a short term memory. So I, I like to bring that up, say, you know, inflation is the, one of the silent killers of a retirement portfolio, just like the previous point that we talked about with long-term care costs. Those things can really, really, really put a huge impact um, on your on your retirement and on your income. So, but really nailing down, what does that inflation rate look like? Because if you use a linear, linear inflation rate, if you just like if you use a, a, a rate of return, a linear rate of return rate, it, it, it paints a false sense of reality. Those things don't happen linear. They go up, they go down, they change. And so kind of talking with your clients and really figuring out, okay, what are you good on using? Are you good at using, you know, four or 5% for the next couple of years and then scaling that back to, to four or three. So just being on the same page of that, but you got to adjust for it. All right, let's move on. Another money mistake that people will often make is overlooking the importance of estate planning, right? We, we know that this is something that may not be a priority for everyone, but having your estate plan in order is uh, of, it should be a priority. Yeah, it seems like the these types of conversations are happening more and more and more, at least in our office, and I'm sure around other advisors' offices, just because, you know, the baby, the early baby boomer generation is, is you know, we talk about more and more people are entering retirement every single day, or, you know, 10,000 people are turning 65 every day, whatever the, the crazy stat is. But you have the early uh, part of that generation or the latter part of the generation before are starting to die out. And, and it just seems very uh, a, a big topic of conversation around our office where parents are passing away. So you have that sandwich generation of parents, you know, in their 50s and they have a a parent either living with them or close by that needs care. And, but you also have, you know, college age kids or whatever that are still at home. So you have this, this sandwich generation that I've come across quite a bit, but having, and you see those people who have all their ducks in a row from a, an estate planning standpoint, how much smoother this stuff can be, because it can be chaos in, in no time. And if you have these things laid out, if you have your beneficiary forms filled out correctly, if you have trust set up, if you have your will set up properly, there's just so many things you can have done correctly done, things titled jointly that avoid probate. Now, and you need to be careful with assets that are held jointly because if it's not a husband wife, if it's a parent and a kid and they're jointly held, well, that asset gets passed on to that kid who's probably an adult, but who's on that account with them and it avoids the will. Um, now I get the will may have certain intentions, but that w- that money passes straight to that sibling and they or that kid and they may have siblings where the will says, okay, you know, a third, a third, a third, a third, whatever that may be. And, and it technically doesn't do that because it's jointly held with that one, with that one kid. So anyway, there's a lot of nuances there, revocable, irrevocable trust. Uh, getting an estate planning attorney involved. I even had a conversation with my estate planning attorney yesterday saying, all right, I want to make, uh, I got to get a meeting with you just to update our stuff. Things have changed since we've had our will done. Uh, me taking over this business, you know, just a lot of new nuances, real estate holdings. There's a lot of differences in our, in our lives now and they need updating. So if you got a will in place, great, but it needs to be updated too. All right, just a couple more here to go through on our money mistakes we want to highlight for you. Again, not all of them, but eight that we think are pretty important. And uh, the next one is, I think, really uh, should be a, a priority for anyone getting close to retirement is taking care of that high interest debt. And and not paying that off can be a big money mistake. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, obviously being Dave Ramsey advisor. I got to put my Dave Ramsey hat on, and, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, high interest debt, no, no doubt. Um, depreciating assets like cars need to pay those off. Um, is it ideal to pay off a mortgage? Yeah, sure, absolutely, it is. I mean, that's that's a big overhead expense every single month, but it's also hopefully an appreciating asset and, and doing well. And if you've gotten a mortgage outside of the last couple of years, it's probably a pretty low rate comparatively speaking to what we are in today. Now leaving interest rates out of it because there that's when my math brain kind of nerd brain kicks in, but it's also, it may be a low interest rate and it's quote unquote cheap money compared to what interest rates are now. But again, if you're on a fixed income and in your in retirement, it really should be a big priority to, to pay that house off. Now I don't want you to be house rich and cash poor. That's not responsible either. Because if you need, if you're cash poor and you need money out, well, what do you do? You're probably going to take a home equity line of credit on your house and then you have debt again. So you don't want to, you want to avoid that if you can, but definitely credit card debt. Got to get rid of that. Car debt next. Hopefully student loan debt's already out of the way if you're about to retire. Um, but it's amazing how stuff, how long that stuff can, can yeah. hang on. Yeah. Um, and then, and then mortgage debt after that. So try, try, try your hardest, uh, to pay that off if you want to downsize and then take your proceeds of the, um, of the, the house that you sell and, and, and buy a smaller house, then, okay, hopefully you can take those, ben those proceeds and then just pay cash for a new house. All right, let's close it out with one last one here, Ryan. And that money mistake is forgetting about sequence of returns risk. So first, I guess, remind us what that is and, and why it's so important. Yeah, it's a little bit of a nerdy one. <laughs> but this this kind of the puzzle puzzle um, that of my job that I enjoy doing. So sequence of returns, obviously, what kind of returns you're getting each year, each month. I mean, you can you can granulize that as, as, as small of a term as you want to. But Sequence of returns risk. Uh, the biggest risk on that is if you have a uh, a large downturn like 2022, uh, depending on how you were invested, but different indexes were down anywhere from nine to 30 something percent last year. So if you retired and then you have this sequence of return risk of that, it goes way down. Well, the chances of you running out of money just instantly increase, you know, versus if you retire and then you have two or three years of positive returns completely changes the dynamic of what your nest egg or your portfolio looks like. So I know we can't control sequence of returns, despite people thinking they can jump in and out of the market. You can't um, without uh, taking risk and in, in, in that alone. But sequence of returns depends on what kind of returns we are getting. We have to be flexible in retirement on taking money out of accounts. And what I mean by that is obviously in, in 2020 with COVID, people made adjustments to their portfolios. Now, at the time that the year ended up positive, but during COVID, the market was way down and people weren't doing as much, obviously. So a lot of my retirees scaled back on how much distributions they were taking because one, when the market was down so quick, we didn't know where the end was, but then it proceeded to recover the whole rest of the year. So uh, you need to be aware of what your returns are because you're pulling, if you're pulling money out every single month and the market is down, you know, 5% one month. Okay. Well, you're taking out four or 5%. So boom, now you're down 10. So it can really get out of hand pretty quick. Uh, so you just need to know it needs to be flexible, but that's where your debt going back to the previous point. If you don't have debt, then being able to control your monthly budget is a whole lot easier. Um, if you don't have those large fixed payments every single month. So sequence of returns risk again, kind of nerdy. Um, but that's, I feel like that's where we kind of earn our keep during those down years and kind of navigating those waters on what funds are we selling and how we liquid liquidating and how are we creating that income each month because of the returns and, and what they're doing. All right. Eight big money mistakes, courtesy of Ryan Ledden over Black Oak Asset Management. If you have questions about these or feel like you might be on track to make a mistake or two from this list, sit down with Ryan. He's a financial coach. You can schedule that retirement coach 360 session online right now. Just go to Black Oak AM. Dot com. All right, let's go into the mailbag. Ryan got a question from you this week from Tony, who is in Dallas, Georgia. I'm not sure where is Dallas, Georgia. It's like if you're right in the middle of Atlanta, it's kind of northwest suburb okay. of Atlanta. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Learn something new. All right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Tony, thanks for the question. Here's what he is on his mind today. I'm hesitant to pay off my house because I don't have many other tax deductions at this point, but I have $100,000 in the bank and I only owe $45,000 on the house. 
So it's really tempting just to go ahead and pay it off. What are your thoughts? Good question, Tony. Um, Google search, um, Dave Ramsey paying off house tax deduction uh, in, in whatever order you want to put that in. But he makes a really compelling argument on his podcast one day. And I can't remember, it wasn't too long ago because he's, he's had these soapbox discussions, if you will. And the math just does not work out from a tax deduction standpoint. So paying off your house is much more beneficial than the tax deduction that you get in interest that you are paying is the, is the moral of the story. He kind of breaks it down from a math component. Um, and I want to be cognizant of, of time as far as our pod, podcast goes, because he has several hours of blocks of time. Uh, but he goes through and just says, look, the tax deduction makes zero sense um, uh, to keep that in order to keep the deduction as opposed to paying your house off. So with the ratios that you have, I know there's probably more to your story, Tony. And if you got a hundred grand just sitting there, I get it. You could have it sitting in an interest bearing high yield savings account and earning four and a half percent right now. And your mortgage is 2%. Okay. It's still, it's an amortization table. So interest is front loaded. So it's not going to be just an exact comparison that way. So if you got the money, you owe 45 K just pay it off is be my, my suggestion. Very good question, Tony. We appreciate that. If you have questions for us, blackoakam.com is the website, or you can just call Ryan directly at 470-508-0508. All right, getting to know you question, Ryan, to close out today's episode of the podcast. Here it is for you. What about your current life with the college age version of Ryan uh, have the toughest time believing? Uh, college age, so that would put me playing – minor league baseball. So when you're in your late teens, early twenties, <laughs> you're invincible in anything that you do. So yep. obviously at that age, even though I was making $1,200 a month, probably in uh, a ball or double a ball somewhere, <laughs> um, you think you're going to play forever. You think you're going to make tens of millions of dollars. And you have to think that uh, you have to be very confident, borderline cocky in that world because everybody is good at that level. So you got to have that confidence. If you don't have that confidence in yourself, then that professional baseball would chew you up and spit you out because it's a world game. There's there's guys from all over the country. So I would say not playing baseball and also really owning a financial advisory practice because when I'm in my college age, I didn't go to college right off the bat. Uh, I was drafted out of high school. So my high school brain <laughs> would never think in a million years that I would own a business, much less a financial advisory practice. So yeah, I would say not playing baseball longer and then being a business owner in this financial world. Very good stuff. As always, we appreciate your candor and uh, your honesty here on the podcast. And we appreciate your insight today on these money mistakes. Hopefully, we brought a few to your attention and uh, may make you aware of some things that are so important to pay attention to. And hopefully you will move it forward. All right. If you have questions for Ryan, again, blackoakam.com. Schedule your retirement coach 360 session online there. And Ryan will catch up in a couple of weeks. Thanks. The Perfect Game Retirement Podcast is brought to you by Black Oak Asset Management, serving the greater Atlanta area with offices in Alpharetta and Macon. The show is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe to the show on your favorite app today and never miss an episode. Just search for Perfect Game Retirement to find us. You can also visit blackoakam.com to listen to past episodes, to contact Ryan Ledner, and to learn more about how to pitch a perfect game in retirement. Information provided is for informational purposes only and does not constitute tax, investment, or legal advice. Please consult with a qualified professional before taking any action. Securities and registered investment advisory services offered through Silver Oak Securities, Inc., member FINRA SIPC, Black Oak Asset Management, and Silver Oak Securities, Inc. are not affiliated.